Hello, my name's Adam Drake and I'm a writer and comedian and I produce these interviews, hope you enjoyed them. And for this special final instalment, we thought we'd turn the spotlight on Katie herself and ask about her experience of writing the book and how delicacy, a memoir about cake and death, came to be. So, Katie, hello. Hello. Thanks for trusting me to produce the interview. So we just finished the last one. How did you, how do you feel that you're done? I, I don't think that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never really formally interviewed anyone before. It's actually, it's quite hard, isn't it? Mm. It's quite particular, it's given me a newfound respect for your Lorraines, your Brands, <laughs> <laughs> Russell, <laughs> Kelly. You know, when you're writing, it's just you and, the screen and it's such a sort of <clears throat> introspective experience and then you know and then sort of advocating for it out in the world is a different one again mm. did you think that you could do it because like you say it is a big deal to interview write the book people. or do the little no, the, the interviews it, it is a big job well to... you know who hasn't got a podcast these days for god's sake who isn't talking to people we'll cut this out Dermot Dem- O'Leary's got one called just people <laughs> Because I saw it the other day well, on iTunes and I really pissed myself laughing. It was like, just people. <laughs> so I was trying to recreate just people <laughs> this whole time. So, you know, you're known and adored for your incredibly funny <laughs> turns. Say that. Um, Depends in, who you talk to. You know, Statlet's Flats three BAFTA award winning and in Taskmaster that everyone loves um, and suddenly you've released this memoir that is incredibly funny as we would expect from you but it's also so moving and profound and well written and gracefully written and it it has all these qualities that I think people won't be able to trace back to your other work as good as your other work is uh, when you see someone on TV acting in something someone else has written, I mean, I'm being paid not to be myself. So, you know, why would anyone know that I'm interested in literature and other stuff? Like, I don't think it's a surprise to me that I wrote this. I think I was just waiting until I had the guts to be honest about what I was, what I wanted to do. So if we go back to when we met about three years ago, I remember that you'd just written yeah. a sample chapter. I remember there was a lot of talk around then of, I've got a sample chapter of my book, a sample chapter. Yeah. And if I'm right, that sample chapter became chapter 18 in, in this book. So could you take us back to that time in your life when you yeah. wrote that sample chapter? How did that come about? What was that like? So I was asked to write a sample chapter. Well, how it came about, maybe it was probably as many as three years ago now. Somebody from the publishers um, saw me reading at a short story, at a, a storytelling night. Um, and then I went and, and had a chat with them after that and they sort of said, have you got an idea for a book, really? And I said, no, I don't know what you're on about. Um, so I was sort of, I wasn't talked into it, but I suppose I didn't think I could write a book because all I'd written at that point was scripts, comedy strips, or just like, like uh, sketches, weird sort of experimental strange comedy which is what I which is my favorite thing to write um and uh and my monologue books which were um yeah which are sort of closer closer to this in that um at times when I got stuck I just thought well I'll just think of it like a monologue because I'm writing in first person it sort of was was a way of it seeming less like intimidating and that it had to be that beautiful prose if I could think of it as just, well, you know, I'm just talking directly as if I would, someone was in front of me. So you've, you've had this meeting with the publishers and they said, have you got ideas for a book? Yes, and originally, and I'm embarrassed to say, because I think this would have in some ways made a crap book, a very different book. So I had said, I, I said something to them about that when I was really little, I'd had this cake when I, when I was in France and that I always used to talk about it. I was on holiday with my family in France and I had had this cake to shut me up. And 
it was like just so incredible. And when I ask people what it is and I try and describe it, nobody knows, no one can say what it is for sure. So originally I had this idea that I was going to just go around France trying to find this cake that I ate, which would have been okay, but it's a very different, I, you know, it's quite a twee um, sort of little quest slash travel log type thing, you know. Um, but they were kind of interested in that. So then I went away, and I think that's around about the time also people started dropping dead in my life. So I became a different person as well, but suddenly I became very sort of... Um, I suppose I just became a lot more serious and felt the need to try and uh, make a piece of work that would have more kind of meaning in it and that could somehow match the sort of... I, I suddenly had something I needed to articulate and put on paper that in a different way that I hadn't had before. Not that bad things hadn't happened to me before or that life had been easy, but that I think there's just a sort of before and after when you lose someone of who you were before, who you were after. So the me, the me after was just like a very different type of writer. So I went back and said it, the ideas changed. And also I'd started to read a lot more and I suddenly realised that um, that writing could be art and I didn't know it could be. That your writing could be art? Well, I'm too scared to call my writing art, but that's deep down, if I'm honest, what I wanted well, to I've do. Well, I've got a whole blurb of people who aren't scared to call it art. No one's calling it art on the back. The word art doesn't feature on the back. No, but the word art isn't on the back, but um, I think I think like an art an artist more than a writer. I feel like I'm uh, in line of duty, but so you have this meeting. You I've not, you I didn't think really about get on with it? Sorry, I watched I watched two eps and I I, I don't know. I just felt exhausted. Well, it's a lot like this. Um, so people will be interested to hear about how it started with this memory of a cake in France because holding the book now, the cake's on the front. It says a memoir about cake and death, and yet. Cake is just the scaffolding now, isn't it? Even oh, yeah. though yeah, well, it's like I'm anti-cake. At the beginning, yeah. I say I resent cake and I really hate it because yeah. I feel like it's there at the most painful times in my life, like mocking me almost with its yeah. stupid, like you know, kind of pink decoration. And the end of the uh, introduction is cakes are filled with trauma for me. There's been a lot of cake in my life, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, so the publishers have bought this book about cake. <laughs> And you are experiencing really horrible events in your personal life um, with loss of people that and you love. in my professional life. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so you sort of, it must have been strange being in this position where you were tethered to a commitment that you'd made to the publishers to give them a book about cake. And yet what was happening in your personal life was guiding you away from an idea that I guess by its nature was quite superficial and light. Yeah, well, yes and no. Like, I, I wrote against the theme, as in, like, I wanted that to be the, the contrast, that people would think it was going to be this sort of, like, light, you know, kind of feminine thing, and that it's really dark and painful and um, <clears throat> in contrast to this to cake um, so I just went back in and I said okay well if it's not about this one cake it's about like 20 yeah. and uh, they're all just ways to tell 20 stories that mm. I wanted to tell so that sample chapter was a bit of an experiment it was a bit desperate in that I was trying to really prove to people that I could write because I didn't think I could and I didn't think I was smart enough and I didn't think my sentences would be complex and like beautiful enough so it was quite difficult to read because it, I wasn't there was no clarity I was just trying to make it impressive um, and um, it thinking about it, it doesn't really represent what the book became you know in, in the sample chapter that you wrote this first sample chapter that became chapter 18 with this the, 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 I think I'm obsessed because track. it was it was so different to this, and I would, I would yeah. never have guessed that that sample chapter could become. Really? I mean, this this book is so good, yeah, so and I would never have guessed that it could become this. The thing that sums up the style for me is at the beginning of chapter eight, 
low fat cake or being thin capitalist spaces with your mum, <laughs> you have a, I don't know what it's called, the quote introduces a chapter, like a epigram, but something like that. And the one that introduces this chapter is Nothing Aches Like a Heart from Gemma Collins. Mm, which is a misquote. Which we listened to in her podcast together on a plane. Mm. And she was trying to mention <laughs> the Miley Cyrus featuring Mark Ronson song, Nothing Breaks, Nothing Breaks like, like a Heart. Yeah. And she got it wrong yeah. and said, Nothing Aches yeah, Like a Heart. Yes, nobody knows that. And we found it. We found it incredibly funny <laughs> and incredibly moving. <laughs> yeah, and for me, that true. quote and that moment that led to us hearing that quote sums up what's so joyfully unique about the style of this book is that That's it's nice. incredibly funny and incredibly moving at the same time. And it gives the reader permission to laugh and or cry and have whatever emotionally 12 dimensional reaction they want to have. Now, this sample chapter, I, it really... <laughs> well, hang on, hang on, hang on. So, you read it, and you said to me two words that you said. Ever. Should we say it together? One, you told me two, to three, stop don't reaching. Reach. <laughs> <laughs> you said stop reaching. Don't reach. <laughs> don't reach, a.k.a. featuring don't reach. And... <laughs> What I understood. What did I mean by that? Exactly. So what you meant by that was, I was trying too hard, and I was trying to impress some imaginary figure I had in my head, some sort of old white man, yeah, who was in charge of what, yeah, who was who was in charge of the canon of good literature, because I'd read a lot of. Um, I've read a lot of, you know, good books, but it's like I would read that and think that that's the only way to be good at writing, to try and emulate this kind of writing. So how I got from that sample chapter to this was by reading and and I was just pathetically under-read. I feel like there were, when I was younger, I just never wanted to kind of stop and pause. Reading, to me... Now it's like, I'm, you know, sort of all I do at the moment. No, that sounds really pretentious. What, it, what I mean is like, it's such a big part of my life now. And it wasn't before um, because I, a mind that isn't sort of at home with itself, you don't want to stop and um, mm. pause. I think either I would read something and I wouldn't understand it straight away and I'd feel intimidated and I'd kind of want to throw it across the room and it would just so narcissistic I'd read something good and I wouldn't feel inspired I would just feel like I'm so shit at right I could never write that I'm so crap mm. so reading was like this big sort of I don't know like emotional experience where I would just feel worse not better and so I had to get over that and I had to be willing to like learn by sort of showing writing to people and have them critique it so that I could learn. Once I got over that, I started learning and then I started enjoying because <laughs> I felt like I'd learned how to write a bit more. And it was great. It was realising that there was this direct style of writing that was, yeah, that was direct and it was about the intention and it was about the overall feeling, and it was about the content, and it was about what you what you choose to write about, what you left out, and it wasn't about going to a thesaurus and picking like the the grandest word. It was very like I want to say prosaic language, like everyday language. But it was the it was the how, and it was the. You know, like it was the, the it was the best, most effective way to express something, not the sort of um, most complicated. I didn't even know that prose poetry existed mm. until these in, <laughs> until I started reading. That was like a huge thing that unlocked something because I like that it's fragmented and you can kind of break the rules, and um, because I'm quite scared of grammar still, and there were many times I would ask you to. to correct the grammar of something um, because I still feel a bit left out I feel like I don't really know all the magic rules now even now of how to mm. write um, but I have learned so much like about the technical stuff which I'm so kind of grateful for and I wish I'd known it like years ago 
yeah so prose poetry like I, I suppose discovering this 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 genre if you can call it that was so so helpful because there are points where I that there are times when it's close to my attempt at that mm. and I don't have I'm not brave enough to sort of really admit that deep down I'd love to try and write poetry because yeah. I'd be too dead I'd be too embarrassed aside from the emotional experience you have writing this book were there any just kind of specific lessons that you know if you had to give a workshop on how to write a book well I mean I couldn't well I don't know about how to write a book but the things that really stick in my mind are things really simple things like like one thought per sentence was a massive help especially when I was trying to capture like how uh confusing grief can be and how you know I was trying to find a place to contain all these different emotions which overlap and I remember there was an edit I did where I went through and got rid of those words and they've got they've got a particular name but they're unhelpful words like seems like Mm. perhaps maybe when I was reading if there was a sentence I'd love either because of the way something was described how it was described or the structure of the sentence I'd write it down in my notebook and I had like just notebooks full of um you know other people's words but it's, it, it's so, I guess, as we kind of near the end of our chat. Oh, my God. <laughs> it sounds like you started this whole journey writing this book for someone else. A kind of... Well, I'd say more out of fear and defence. From fear, Yeah, a place of fear and defence. And it sounds like by the end, once you'd read other women writers that were writing the way that... Writing in the language that spoke yeah, to you exactly. and once to you... It sounds almost like you came back at the end to where you started. It was realising that there are skills that I use in writing sort of daft comedy that you can still utilise mm. um, in writing about something sad. Yeah, it was, it, was coming, it was coming back to a sort of honesty of well, what, what would I actually like to read about. The only compliment I remember really remember taking really loving... The editor once said to me, he said, I've got no cuts for this bit. You've got a really good sense of rhythm. That was like the most wonderful compliment Mm. that I've ever, ever. Mm. Because I thought, oh, I think I know what he means. Because I hate structure and I still don't think I understand it. But when I'm writing, there's something that goes, oh, I feel like music. Like I feel that's the time to come out of that now. And I just feel that we've had enough of that now. And I can just feel that that's like where to end now. Mm. And I can just like... You know, so there is something going on. Last question, when did you feel like you'd done it? I think when every chapter felt like it was kind of zinging, mm, mm. I sort of went, well, this is as good as, mm. this is as good as... And also when I was just like, I couldn't go on and my eyes felt red and tired and my back hurt. Mm. Mm. Um, I thought this, this has to be good enough now because I'm done. <laughs> Um, well, congratulations. Thank Delicacy you. out now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I actually Sorry, throw it in? Ending it with throwing it is so funny. I'm just going to iron up my frown, okay. frown lines for the final. <laughs> Casey, thank you so much for trusting me to ask you these questions about the writing process today. and I trust you with my life. For, huh? And for <laughs> trusting me to produce these interviews and more widely for trusting me to read and reflect and feed back on the book as you were writing it. And Delicacy, is that right? Dr. Dr. Windmill. Is that weird? Um, <laughs> the gradation. It's not really that you can't really feel. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> did I have lunch with my hand in a hole? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, again.